Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Hey, don't forget to check out the Pacific War Podcast week by week in association with Kings and Generals. Hey, and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button so I can feed my two feathery co-hosts. Welcome back to the Pacific War Podcast. I'm your dutiful host, Greg Watson, and I am joined here by my friend, Eric. Please hello to the audience. Hey, everyone again. Julian. I don't know where I felt like I get a little drink around here, do you, bud? You might have remembered him from, uh, well... I'd say one of our more popular podcasts came out just a while ago on um, what if Hoku Shinran actually occurred. So what if the uh, Japanese invaded the Soviet Union? Seems to be uh, one of the more popular episodes I've done. Shut the fuck up. Know your fucking place, trash. Well, that, thank you very much. It was, a, it was a lot of fun, that one. We uh, went on a few tangents and uh, got and lost a little on the way, but... That was- won't happen here. <laughs> There's no way we could go off on a tangent or get lost in the weeds with this one. Yeah, you know, it's only pure history with this one. <laughs> yes, logic, facts, and reason. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know what I'll name this, but I'm sure the audience can already tell. This is a bit uh, this episodes on the wonkiness of the premise of the man in the high castle. Uh, both the TV series that I'm sure. 99% of you have seen, and uh, the novel, which I read, I think, 11 or 12 years ago at this point. But uh, I had to do some notes and research uh, what I might have forgotten. So, uh, not to get too crazy into it, what do we mean by wonky? You know, we're going to poke fun, talk about the unrealistic nature. I mean, everyone knows it's a little bit unrealistic, but I'm going to do some deep dives into it, too. Uh, we're going to do it in two parts. The first part, I will try to summarize the little bit of knowledge that we know about how World War II occurred in this uh, alternate history, of which there isn't actually real concrete information. There's sporadic sprinklings that are told to us by Philip K. Dick, and that's about all we got to go on. And then part two, we can actually talk about the world of Man the High Castle, the TV series, uh, the wackier version in the book, and uh, give our, I guess, our critique of some of the silliness and other things that are occurring in that just, world. Just the, the, the fun nature. I mean, it, well, obviously. Not fun. A, a post-Nazi world is not fun. Oh, yeah, of course. It's how I would describe it. The fun <laughs> world of the man I guess. So, yes, sir. <laughs> but overall, it was, it was entertaining to watch. Yeah, just to course. see, like, yeah. All right. I guess we'll uh, get started. All right, and uh, everyone, I tried to summarize this as best as I could, and I did not put any of my opinion in this. I rarely tried to just go by the notes that were from Philip K. Dick himself and what he said about it. And it, it it's hard to fill the gaps, and I did not do so. So the main reason we have uh, an alternate history in this world all falls upon kind of one key moment. In 1933, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt is assassinated by Giuseppe Zangadas. And this seems to, you know, be the big thing that causes the uh, divergence and what creates this world. I just like to say, it seems every time there's an alternate history, it always falls on just one person being killed. Like, or Churchill, just, yeah, it's always those yeah, two. It's yeah. like, oh, if this one person was killed, then all of a sudden it would just fall apart. And I was like, cool. So everyone else is just twiddling their thumbs. It's like, oh no, Roosevelt's dead. I guess if, we better just give up now. <laughs> if Archduke Franz Ferdinand was not assassinated, we would not have anime today. There you go, people. <laughs> that You know, that you can't argue with that. One. That's a deep dive meme right there. <laughs> anyway, so the United States is uh, led originally by his vice president uh, after 1933, which was John Garner. And then a Republican takes over named John Bricker. So obviously, Philip K. Dick just looked at the most possible candidates and threw them in. Although I have to admit, he did a lot of research when he wrote this book. It was an incredible amount of research uh, for the day. He did a good job. 
Uh, both these presidents failed to enact the New Deal. And uh, this also leads the Great Depression to not be alleviated, uh, if at all. It's not made clear if it just lingers forever or if the economy just is in a slump for most of the time period. Well, then I guess it would be they would get out of it at World War II. Like, no matter how it starts, I mean, I don't believe that they would stay in this depression for an extra decade. It's it just <laughs> everyone, even the rich to the poor, everyone wanted out of this goddamn depression, except for the real rich. Like the, the, yeah, it the actually really side. worked out for the real yeah, rich. Yeah. <laughs> but for like 99% of the population, they're like, we want to get the hell out of this situation. Yeah. And uh, because uh, the economic slump is still going on in the United States when World War II uh, occurs, which is basically almost identical to what happens in our timeline, the way it starts, uh, well, the United States is keeping to its isolationist policy, as it kind of was for the most part. Uh, but more importantly, it never begins the Lend-Lease program. And that is, that is a kudos to Philip K. Dick in the 1960s, figuring that was one of the key you know, yeah, reasons that was one. Without the Lend-Lease, Russia is pretty, I would say Russia would be screwed 1940 mm. to 41, merely that they probably would have taken Stalingrad and Moscow yeah. out the lend lease, but that doesn't mean they're going to lose. It just means they would have been pushed back further before the supply chain of the Germans just completely failed as it already right. was. You don't have to worry about all that because in this world, everything just goes right for the Axis. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Even winter, for some reason, just never happened. It, it just, it oh. was summer all year long. Yeah. Oh, I can't, yeah, yeah, I can't express knowing a lot of the conditions and everything, how kind of silly it is in the end. Well, anyways, lend program is not initiated. And then, well, Sir Winston Churchill assassinated in just, 1940. Just to make sure. Just to, yeah, just to make sure that there's no possible one man that can change <laughs> the course of history, just like turns the tides. Because w w without Churchill's speeches, England would just have fallen apart. It w would have given up without Churchill's speeches. As but, great as I will say, Churchill's speeches, amazing. When you actually listen to them and all, you're like, oh, damn. If I was a civilian, that would pump me up too. But oh, yeah. well, he but, knew how to work a crowd. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's going a little bit further in the history of this, but Joseph Stalin will also be, he'll be executed in 1949. So if you wanted to get rid of the whole house of cards, it does happen. Yeah. Uh, well, Nazi Germany, as a result, conquers the Soviet Union, exterminating most of its Slavic population for Lebensraum. So that occurs. Is, isn't that like, isn't that most of the Russian population, if not all of it? A uh, vast majority of it, and uh, whoever survives, we are told, I think in a single sentence in the book, are living like aboriginal nomads in Siberia. So, yeah, that's, that's how that one works out. Uh, it does not explain to us exactly how the UK falls. They just capitulate. So they're invaded or they surrender. It's not actually... Uh, Without Churchill's speeches, they, they all just decided, well... We don't got a leg in this fight anymore. Yeah. On the other side of the world, which is closer to where I'm at as the Pacific War Channel, and I laughed so hard when I read this. It is so simplistic. It is absolutely perfect. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just read it as I wrote it down. Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 is a decisive naval battle, destroying <laughs> all of the U.S. Pacific fleet entirely. <laughs> it's yeah. just all there. It's you know because the the U.S. never had ships out at sea. They just they parked them all in one port and they just said we're gonna wait. Husband Gimmel was thinking to himself, why even have ships on the uh, coast of the United States? Let's just put them all in the port, and we'll San just yeah. San Francisco never existed. Yeah, and you know what? The Philippines. Let's not even have any naval and nothing over there. Let's just have it in Hawaii. Apparently. I mean, I can't say that's what occurs, but anyways. Oh, and it's followed up by an invasion of Hawaii in December, surfing season. So the Japanese land ships in high wave season in Hawaii, and then they occupy it. And um, actually, apparently, Americans take it back in February of 42, but it, it ends up falling right back to the Japanese. So uh, the Japanese follow this up because uh, they're apparently completely uncontested in the Pacific. I guess the United States has no Navy since... It's, it's got to be like that. Yeah. 
Uh, they conquer Australia, impossible, but all right. They conquer New Zealand, yeah, they could probably manage that. Yeah, if they really, I mean, they would have to put all of their eggs in one basket. And let's be honest, they're not gaining that great of strategic place by taking New Zealand. But Oceania is taken. And uh, I mean, on top of everything in our timeline, so, you know, Southeast yeah. Asia is taken, the resources in Dutch East Indies. I mean, it's funny. I guess Philip K. Dick didn't even think about the oil question. I wonder why Japan went to war. I assume it's the same situation with the oil embargoes, but how did the United States? I mean, well, but that's I, another story. But I guess if the fleet was taking out, then the oil wouldn't be an issue anymore for Japan because those lines would right. be secured. So I would give it to them. They would have the fuel that they would need. Doesn't mean they have any, anything else. <laughs> it's just the fuel. And uh, oh god, we're getting to my favorite part. Yeah. And this is this is something that's exclusive to the books because uh, I think in the TV series, I remember seeing a picture of what the map looks like, and I think it completely negates this oddity. So Germany conquers Iceland and Greenland before it uh, starts attacking what is the Americas, and uh, what is you know the United Kingdom basically all capitulates save for one, which we don't really understand what's going on. So the Caribbeans uh, give up, South and Central America they all capitulate, and um, this is where it gets a little confusing. Canada doesn't lose. It's Canada. <laughs> yeah, so Canada is. Um, it, there's a there's a line in some dialogue where it says, you know, the Germans, they end up attacking uh, on both, like uh, on the eastern coast of the United States, but they also attack through Canada, but it does not say that Canada is conquered or anything. So I guess Canada just allows them to go through, uh, as well as Mexico. Uh, yeah, they would have to. I mean, well, even at that time, Canada was only, what, around 12 million population yeah, I mean, on, on, on the highest. So... Yeah, it's not much they Wait, can do. I, I, anyone who is listening to this that's curious, if you look up the official map from the book, it is striking. Everything is colored in, you know, a tint of red for the Germans yeah. and a tint of yellow for the Japanese, and then just bright teal blue for Canada without any explanation. It's because really... us Canucks, we just, what, what the U.S. couldn't do, we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you watch the TV series, there's, yes. there's one see. episode at the end. I think you, it's when... um. One of the German commanders is showing the attack plan to go after the Japanese. You see that the neutral zone that goes all the way through Canada. So yeah. they split Canada the Even same way the States that, is. In the series, in season one, you actually see it too. And it yeah. shows the whole world. And you literally see Asia is all like Japan. Then like Africa and all that has the same split. Yeah. The same, um, I don't, South, I forget South America. South America has a neutral zone in the middle. So it's almost identical to so American it's, it's, Canada. Yeah, so you have, I feel like that's all they did for all the continents was just sliver, yeah. neutral, sliver. And uh, neutral. in the book, Mexico is so Vern, if I remember correctly, it's its own uh, independent entity. I think it, it struck a deal with Germany, which actually kind of would happen in World I mean, War II. For some reason in history, Mexico is always targeted by Germany. <laughs> well, they want those territories. They want Texas back. Yeah. Uh, they, I bet they still do. Yeah. And uh, so then we get to the phase where the, the Germans end up sending kind of like a please surrender to the United States. And the United States says no. So at this point, the Japanese have, in the book, I believe they actually take over China, whereas in the show, they don't. But anyways, Japan takes a good chunk out of uh, Siberia, takes over most of the Chinese. So Japan's in a position to attack the United States as well. So Japan is going to hit them from the West Coast and Germany hits them from the East Coast. And uh, it's intense. Apparently, the Americans fight back tenaciously. The Germans break through at Long Beach and they occupy major cities along the Eastern Coast. The Japanese do likewise in the West, taking, you know, California and major American cities in the West. And in the meantime, we're looking at an elongated World War II. So the Soviet Union, it's, it buckles in 47 by the combined force of the Nazi Reich, which is Nazi Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, Italy, Franco, Spain, because he joins, the Vichy France, Denmark, Slovakia, and Croatia. And the United States holds out against the German and Japanese until the atomic bomb is dropped on Washington, completely destroying it and uh, taking out the US government, most senior military leadership, and exile governments. It all collapses. And with that, 
and I love this, in March of 1946, the remnants of the governor of the government, sorry, under J. Edgar Hoover, because he comes back. Yeah. Great president. Uh, he <laughs> surrenders. Uh, but the American civilians, they do fight on for another two years tenaciously, and they get uh, pushed into what we know as the neutral zone in the middle of the country. And on uh, September the 18th of 1947, victory over America is declared. And a I would call it a, a, a conquest of America is accomplished, basically. And that's when we see the Americans become three different zones, the Pacific states in the West, the Nazi American Reich in the East, and the slim little free America buffer zone in the middle. Because that was a good idea to have a buffer zone. The, uh, the Germans and yeah. the Japanese weren't going to play nice. It makes sense. They, they knew, just like the U.S. and Russia, like, you were the enemy of my enemy, so you're my friend until that enemy is gone and uh it even says that there's a massive immigration of refugees into america during all of this in which it's like from all over the world uh as we know in the show uh the japanese once the war is over you know they start to really prize pre-war americana uh kind of like how americans prize uh, artifacts from aboriginal uh hmm. Yeah. tribes so there was a there was a play on that and you, you can tell them the series does play homage to that idea because there's like this big drive to show native americans and then how the japanese see the americans of pre-war stuff uh nazi germany reshapes europe into its own image and in, in the books it's it's pretty wild it's like uh germany is ridiculous in the 20 years until the 1960s <laughs> where technologically it's much more advanced than you we are could now. ever believe <laughs> It colonizes the moon, and by the time the book is taking place, I think in 62, it is landing people on Mars. So, before Elon Musk. Yep. Oh, also, I think it's said in the TV series, one of the most batshit crazy things occurs. Germany, or Italy for that matter, drains the Mediterranean Sea by literally placing like a dam at Gibraltar. I can't and help. I can't remember. And I know in the series it's brought up. There, there was a model. Um, uh, Joe Blake's father is probably yeah. Yeah, he's talking about it, but I can't remember if he said it's already built or it's planned to be built. But yes, they and, damaged uh, Gibraltar. So the idea, which was a real idea <laughs> in 1901 or something, it was talked about with all the major nations in the world of doing this project to quote unquote discover a new fertile land to feed the world and if it would have happened i i alter history hub made an episode on this it would have killed like a yeah. billion people it, yeah, it, like, it would have not been it would have been a dust bowl like the sahara it's like a five-year-old came up with that idea yeah. like who had no understanding of geology no understanding of the world or soil erosion or yeah because salt water you know just say, well and not to mention the Mediterranean is salt water to start with. You drain that lake. It's not like it's a freshwater bed. It's salt water. It's just yeah. rock and hey. drained away. Like if you if you live in North Africa, yeah, whatever. It it's it's fine. It doesn't matter that there's an entire ocean going all over everything, killing all the agriculture that's been there for hundreds of thousands of years. Not just that. What Italy is gone. <laughs> oh yeah. Italy, Spain is gone like all the way up into france is gone like, but in the magical world of the man in the high castle it, it turns works. into a fertile great land where there's so much farmland and then the germans uh well they kill all the people in africa but <clears throat> yeah, yeah that happens and uh there's a well we'll call it the the mega holocaust 2.0 uh, under the germans uh across most of the world that they control which is a lot uh, the Lebensraum actually occurs, so they basically all the way to Moscow, they incorporate it with, you know, just making German babies, and I mean, it must have been crazy. And, uh, oh yeah, by the time the book is occurring, which is 1962, the Germans are said to be leading a genocide over the continent of Africa against Africans, while simultaneously bringing back African slavery in Europe and America. Good times for, yeah. for, for everybody there. But uh, Canada is not conquered. So, you know, there's always that. You have to look at the bright side. And uh, Latin America is kind of this last bastion of a place of where you could run away to, which is in the TV series. I think they say like uh, the, the kid 
uh, yeah. Open Guru, uh, what is his name, John Smith or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, yeah, his I kid think, can go there. I don't know if they were going to Mexico or South America, but I know the yeah, so yeah, been on a like boat. South America. Yeah, they, they went on a boat and they had to try and sneak down south. Yeah. And uh, so at, at this point, we're kind of in the world of the Man in the High Castle, which is 1962. Uh, and the book, it's only a few days. The book is extremely short. I like for people who've never read it. it and for me, when I read it, I, the thing that bothered me the most is I wanted to know more about the world, but it, it ends very abruptly. And it's like almost heartbreaking. You're like, oh my God, what, what what's going on? Yeah. But the TV show, basically, I think it's after, season, I don't know if it's season it's like, one, it's. Yeah, yeah. Like season two starts off kind of, like I've never read the book, but I know kind of, how it goes and season two kind of gets into it but by like midway season two is diverged like it's yeah. it's past that by now we're talking like game of thrones after season eight or whatever when the writers exactly. are like we're going into uncharted territory and the ratings will be great <laughs> it's literally happened but at least with man in the high castle it was enjoyable <laughs> like except for one character i can't express enough i have nothing against the actress but juliana crane was the most obnoxious person I've ever seen really? in a TV series. She was worse than the mom in The Walking Dead. All she does is ruin people's <laughs> lives. Anything she gets involved in gets other people killed. Or like, like look at Frank Frank, her, her husband at the beginning. He, yeah, Frank, that that character, holy God. It, I think he is the perfect representation of just the everyday man, the one who wasn't cold, the one who wasn't like, for some odd reason killed by either side he was just a regular bloke like all right i'm a subject of japan now but i'm just gonna keep doing what i'm doing and then just yeah. one bad thing after the it's other like, oh my girlfriend basically just abandoned me oh well she's cheating on me ah oh, i'm imprisoned oh my family has just been murdered by the japanese well i can't get any worse from here yeah god but the one thing i will say at least he gave Frank gave Inspector Kido a really good character arc. That the, the yeah. two, the Frank and Kido, I, I love that whole back and forth. Like, because like Kido knew right away, like, I turned this guy against me. Like he was a loyal subject, just wanted to live, and everything I did pushed him against me. And that's why the ending of that here, I know a little tantrum again, but the ending for those two, I thought was really well done in season three sad as hell like oh my god like heartbreaking but i won't i won't get into it right away but uh one thing of interest to me because for anyone who's read the not just the the man in the high castle novel if you've read philip k dick he has um themes that go across all his books we'll call it well there's like one major theme and it's, it's really played out in this one but uh one of the themes in in the book is the um there's like how to describe it. There's an arc for all the characters that's been specifically made to kind of have a point to it. Okay. And uh, it wasn't, you couldn't replicate it with with the TV series. And there's like five characters basically in the book and in the TV series there's like 30, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't work. But uh, it is interesting the way that they had to change the arcs and how they had to fit uh, the narrative for the TV series. But I'll talk about it a bit later because I think most of this episode, since I know that I've read the book and you haven't, I'll I'll be the one to talk about like the wackiness of the book. And I'll uh, ask questions. Like I no, I, I am too. really curious about how certain characters. I know like we don't know the ending of most of them from the book perspective because there's only mm, one book. Well, all of them, all of them have ex- the the well because there's only like five characters, but yeah. All of them have very specific arcs. Like they have a story and an ending to it, except for Juliana Crane. My, well, she kind of doesn't have an ending. She kind of just goes into the sunset, so to say. <laughs> but uh, it's there's a specific message in his book. And it's if you've ever read Philip K. Dick, the, 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 there's a specific like underlying message. And it's basically drug infused, mind you, because that guy, wow, that guy did a lot of drugs. <laughs> Anyone who's read uh, If Electric Sheep Sleep, uh, Blade Runner uh, is the movie version of it. It's it's on those lines. Okay, okay. But uh, yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about the the wonkiness of the world of the Man in the High Castle as far as the TV series is considered? Uh, well, season one, 
I thought was really well done. Like if all that wonkiness in the thirties actually happened, like don't know how it does, but for some reason it does. I really did like the way that how they portrayed, well, how Germany would act, like how Japan would act. Like it really did show a good alternative universe and that I have really enjoyed. Like the whole, how the U S was still see like Americans were welcomed into the Nazi right as long as you supported them, participated in the genocide, and like, I remember yeah. um, for for my girlfriend uh, in the first in the first season the the thing and I didn't say anything to her because you know I'd already watched most of the series and I kind of wanted to like see her reaction and she said the same thing as most people it's so unsettling that it's normal. That's, the, that's everyone treats good. it yeah like it's very like they're normal this is society and that's what's like kind of the appeal of the show it's like to normalize this could have really happened you know I, I think the best scene to summarize all of that which i think was episode one or two when he um the ashes joe yeah no joe blake is in the truck it gets pulled over by a cop and you're like oh, oh it's a mm. cop and you see him talking. He is so friendly. He's like, oh, I got an extra sandwich if you want. Like, you would think, like, yeah, oh, yeah. he's, like, the perfect cop. Like, you would, he's the type of cop you would want to run into. Everyday like, America, yeah. Exactly. And then they just see the snow start yeah. falling. And that was good. And Joe, uh, Joe Blake is like, what's going on? Like, what is this? He's, and the cop, not even flinching or, like, the, the look of, like, as he's eating his egg sandwich. It's like, oh, it's Tuesday. It's just, you know, it's the... Uh, the people who are have mental retardation, the Jews and all that, it's when we, we, we cremate them. And then he just takes a bite out of his sandwich as these ashes are just falling around him. And you see it in Joe Blake's face. He's like, oh my God, <laughs> like, are you serious? And the cops is like, yeah, all right, there you here. Go on your way now, you know, have a good day from that. And it's like, whoa, that's like when it hit hard. I think for me, when I realized like, all right, they're not going to be, uh, you know, beat around bushes. Glaze. Yeah, it's not sure it at all. Going for it. Yeah, you know, I know, like some people do give the series a lot of flack for some things, but um, for an alternate history show, like the only way I can compare it is I used to watch a show. I mean, a lot of people probably see it called Fringe. Fringe has a identical kind of parallel universe aspect to it where but it's more about the cold war and it's like a communist kind of world and stuff mm -hmm. but um i think they did a really good job with normalizing and trying to make it realistic because it's it's honestly it's difficult they have to tackle some really weird situations like how the japanese are portraying themselves to be almost it's it's awkward because for the germans it's uh this racial issue yeah which makes sense in their world, but for the Japanese who are controlling the, uh, the Pacific states, they're combating with themselves this kind of issue of, are we superior to like the, the whites in the yeah. states? But it's not, a, it's not like the, you see in the, uh, the Eastern Reich. And it, it's messy. And it would be yeah. messy if it was like this. It'd be really weird. And it, it doesn't make sense, really. But I honestly, I think I prefer the portrayal of the Japanese over like the Nazis was very clear code. Like you said, we all it's knew easy. It. We know yeah. where that's. Yeah. But like, like I said, Kido, he, his character as this, like this pure traditional Japanese character, who's very traditionalist in his mentality, like pre-war uh, Japan, he comes over and he just, he keeps having these dilemmas as he's seeing more and more people. And he's just like, well, I understand before why we were doing this, but aren't these supposed to be our people? Like, aren't we supposed to be like working together? And here I am, I'm killing all these people who didn't say anything or do anything. And then you have like the pot, the, the emperor is actually turning sides too. Like he's starting to believe like, you know what? Maybe we should wax off. Maybe like, do we want to be like the Nazis? And it was almost like they saw what the Nazis were doing and they were like whoa like we have no problem killing anyone at all but we need a reason to kill them like yeah. these Germans are just killing everyone we can actually talk a little bit about the premise because the premise relies and in the books it's actually the same situation but the books 
had a better way of explaining it. In the books, the Germans have an overwhelming superiority over the Japanese because their technology advances much more. And it's, mm -hmm. it's predominantly rocket technology, but they have actually a lot of other things. I mean, they explore Mars. Like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But in the, Man the Mi in, in the Man the High Castle, they basically make it a question about the nuclear weapon. So the Germans have it and the Japanese don't. And it's simplistic. It's also really stupid because the Japanese had a nuclear program. And they wouldn't have just not created it by the 1960s. It's like always bothered me about the man in the high castle that yeah, the Japanese because... are fighting to get the the technical know-how, but they would have had it for sure. Well, I know like the best comparison would obviously be Russia and the US and how Russia got the bomb. But the problem with that is Russia took a bunch of German scientists to bring it over. Now but with the Japan, Japanese would have had whoever was on the, the Western Americans, coast. That's true. Like if they captured California, it's not like all the East Coast, there's there's a lot of good universities there. Like they probably would have captured some. But uh, I'm just saying, you you can give rationales as to how long it takes, but it's 1962. They should have had it by they, then. It, and I mean, in the series, they ended up getting it, but it was as a result of getting the documents through uh, um, the I German spoiled, saboteur. Yeah, uh, whoever he was, yeah. Which, anyway, there's a big, in the book, he, there's a different mission as to why that's going on, which makes more sense, uh, arguably in the series, although... It's kind of cool that this is like a race to get the bomb so it equalizes the playing yeah. field to keep this wonky world keep you know still going but, but I also, yeah, yeah i silly. think what they did really well they really highlighted throughout the entire series how each hated each other like the japanese yes. hated the german the germans hated the japanese and you see it throughout and you're like you know what that historically is very accurate because we know they hated each other like even as allies germany just needed them in the east to keep the u.s off but like they didn't trust them they thought they were the the asians were still lesser people than them yeah because they're playing like well it's kind of like yeah. i mean for those who've never read mind count uh and i mean why would you right but <laughs> i i suggest anyone who wants to read something to just tell you what stupidity is like it's it's great indication of how absolutely that shit crazy hitler was uh but when he, he he mouths off about like the japanese having an advanced culture and he actually makes a note of the japanese early on this is like in the 1920s when he's writing you know, it was before 23 some of his writing so i don't know how much the germans would have played ball with the japanese when it came to this but given they took over the world together i guess they would yeah like also you have to understand by the, it's the end of a war, so neither nation is in a place that they want to probably continue. Oh, for another war. 10 years, because of population loss. I mean, I can't yeah. even imagine the numbers of this woman. Even if Germany would have won inevitably, it would have broken them to try and take Japan on after it, Japan also just defeated the U.S. And good luck getting past the Japanese Navy, which is that's, and that's basically I, everything. I love the man in the high castle. When you see the Navy coming to uh, San Francisco, you have the either it's the Yamoto or it's a sister ship of it, but you saw yeah, it. Yeah, oh. it's one of the best scenes. I bet you yeah. it cost them a lot of money. <laughs> oh, I bet so. And like the Yamoto has a helipad on it too now. So you're like, yeah. oh my God, they modernized, they modernized it. And I'm like, yeah, the Japanese Navy never stopped. Like they continue, like, like the US Navy, they continuously built up on it. So Japan would still, if they won, Japan would be a powerhouse. Like Asia except would the, be. Except for the women. nuclear question. Yes. And of course the German, and we did see the battle plans, like I think season three, it would have been a lot of like V2 rockets that they were still using that would nuke them along with bombers. I guess they had no idea what radiation was back then because it just seemed like it was, nuke all the cities yeah well the japanese the forces. <laughs> in the i think even in the tv series it's like this, the japanese just don't have rocket technology no like they i think there's like a a, a point where they're talking about taking an airplane and how quick it is because in the man in the high yeah. castle they say it like takes Three hours. minutes or something in the man in the high castle oh, to get okay. across no, in, in the series it was two to three hours to get from the u.s to berlin to the u.s to london because they what don't do care do? about fuel consumption it <laughs> doesn't Not mean anymore. anything 
<laughs> it's just it's just let's just put rockets on trains yeah monorails yeah <laughs> like whatever but like also uh, i guess we're going this too like the another main character john smith that was i think the perfect portrayal of the american who was like i was devoted to my country i fought for it i did everything for it the nazis still won well shit i need to take care of my family now and all that and you see that slow progression to being like you could tell john never believed that was in like it, you could tell that's what did. they were doing too like yeah. the the, po- the point of the series was to really be like this could happen this it's not like these people just become monsters like like it's a snap it's a yeah. gradual process indoctrination that's what's actually really good about the series is you mm-hmm. you get a feeling especially in the later seasons when they explain him in the in the movement when like the the nuke goes off in Washington how he actually ends up joining and betraying some of his friends yeah he Jewish. ended up turning on a they started to build a resistant movement I think they remember and he ended up turning on because. Yeah, it was with his um, his buddy, who was an, an SS officer, that he ended up turning on them, and they ended up killing all of his former military friends, which shows a lot. Yeah. But it, I think he said it also shows that it's all it's e- it's easy to be like, oh, I'm American, when you have your government standing to be like, even in the worst of the situation, even if you're captured, like, well, I. I'm American, but the second that government's gone, and you're like, shit, I got a family, I got friends, uh, yeah, I can continue Food fighting. Food on the table. But at the same time, like, shit, I. And they it's make you uh, say, it's like a guy comes to his house and he literally brings like a loaf of bread and some food, and they like grab at it, and that's just to show, like, yes, these people are going through hardship, they are starving, like this is reality of what and happens. That's to how they accepted it, yeah. and that's how. All you had to do probably was, well, tell us where one of these people are. Tell us where one of these uh, undesirables are. And all of a sudden, even the Nazi, and if you look in the series, they were living good. If you were on the Nazi side of it and you were a part of, like, even if you weren't a Nazi, you were just a regular civilian that was doing your day to day, it seemed like you were, you were being taken care of. You were doing good. Unfortunately, to yeah. have that happen, you had to incinerate a bunch of undesirables which is horrible uh so here i'll uh give a the spoiler warning yeah so we'll, we'll talk let's start off you talk a little bit about the ending of the tv series and then uh, i'll put it like a, we'll make it like a part three i'll talk about the differences with the books because yeah. it's there's a lot well, of yeah, differences i think yeah we just spent probably the last 20 minutes going over like season one which was yeah. like that big season where Oh, I mean, we didn't get any great news. Like Adolf Hitler, like dies. Yeah, yeah, he he dies, uh, which would have happened anyways. Like we all knew he was he was on his way out anyways. Um, I think it's uh, Herman. Um, it's Himmler uh, at the beginning. Himmler, yeah, Himmler takes over, and you're like, ah, that kind of makes sense too. Like, I think does he kill Goring or something? Because Goring yeah, would have something. Like, yeah, well, yeah, I think either Goring gets assassinated or something like something like that but i'm like okay yeah that legitimately makes sense and all that but then you start getting into season two and then we'll get the spoilers and then it just the book ends and then it gets all right history history doesn't matter anymore but the entertainment went way up because with the whole like juliana kane and alternate universes kind of thing coming in uh john smith continuously rising through the ranks as he saves like a lot of people and you're like okay this is getting real interesting is he going to become the hero next frank is absolutely <laughs> poor goddamn frank man like frank holy screwed. god like it, it's just one thing after the other with frank i feel so bad for him but keto he starts to like he starts to develop his character too japan starts to realize like well shit i think we overextended a little and we can't really control these people and also we don't really want to we're actually having issues at home already so yeah because in the man in the high castle the, the japanese have a huge issue with uh the free well, free china or it's the communist rebels in china which like would have been very real and yeah, yeah. gave them uh quite a and, and i think also 
homeland Japan was again a little nervous because a lot of the Japanese now are becoming Americanized in, in their colonies. So there was kind of this detach forming between these two parties and in all likelihood, if nothing happened, it's possible that eventually the Japanese in the U.S. was like, screw this, we want our own country. Like, you guys are idiots back there. Uh, and then, uh, oh, and I completely forgot about the, um, the, the minister, the, the Japanese minister. Uh, Tagami. Tagami, yeah. His character, <laughs> really like he's just going back and forth in time, going all over it. I was like, this is entertaining. It that's, doesn't make a lick of sense, but that's the fun. angle. That's like the real uh, the breaking point with the book. It's because at the very end of the book, it it's not like he, he it's not that he's transported to another world. He he has a vision of what another world would look like, and it basically it changes his entire rationale. He ends up in the book. It's completely different. He ends up freeing Frank from the Nazis, and then he has a heart attack and he dies. Oh. Whereas in the series, which I thought was, that's the one part I didn't like about the series. It's just season three opens up and it's like, oh, a drive-by shooter goes by and kills him. And I'm like, well, that's kind of a, yeah. Yeah. Like a lackluster. I knew for someone who like was so pivotal to the storyline, like. They didn't know what to do with them, probably. Probably, yeah. But like then the third season comes and oh my God. It's hard not to laugh with the third season. <laughs> They're like, we're, we built this tunnel and we, we, have, we have this. We're, we're going to be sending tanks. We're going to be sending Nazis to all these planets because all these planets have freedom. And what, what do they need? Nazism. So not only are we, we, we haven't even conquered our own planet because we share it with Japan. But yeah, before they even defeat the Japanese, <laughs> let's go into parallel universes. universes and take and, on. Yeah. A fully strength United States. Like, this is our timeline. Did, did they ever think, you go to another parallel universe, you might be like, oh, Germany's not under national socialism. Does that mean you have to go kill a bunch of Germans? Like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, but, oh, it was entertaining. Then, you, like you said, the ending, the rocket train, that oh, was... Oh, God, that's too funny when you see that. You're like, yeah, of course. <laughs> of God, course there's funny. a rocket train. Because <laughs> just, they had to have rockets on everything oh yeah that was that was the high point of everything in that show it's like rockets on everything yeah. but like oh the premise of the films though i love that premise like they, they're just slowly watching all these other different universes and film reels and you're like oh my god like if i was in that universe and i saw a film of like the allies landing at d-day stalin churchill and roosevelt sitting together um the the toppling of the nazi um, reichstag like yeah fuck like that would be a huge moment for me too i would be like holy shit like that's amazing but at the same time we got we're gonna be sending himmler is just standing there we're gonna be sending tanks to this other planet and then the premise was if you were dead in the yes. other universe you could go through the portal yes. which i mean I guess they just wanted to solve some more financial, Whoa. like production value issues, but I, I whatever. No, but they came up with a solution. They yeah. sent Nazis over into this world, and they somehow got a complete census of the entire population. Yeah, on planet. they have a whole room. Like, yeah. All right, so we know these Nazis aren't alive, so we can go send them in. And I'm like, damn, maybe they would conquer this planet if it only took them a week to make an entire list of the entire population or when they this was funny they killed john smith's character in the other world <laughs> and john smith's reaction to it in like his timeline it was like so nonchalant to be like oh. what do you what do i do in this world you're a salesman a businessman sir oh of, of what sorts door to door <laughs> yeah. and he's, they're like oh oh <laughs> and they're like oh but unfortunately i had to kill him so i can go there now <laughs> like he's already thinking about well maybe i can just go over there instead and i'm like i mean i get it i if i was in that place like 
That and again, spoiler, definitely. spoiler, spoiler, spoilers to everyone listening. I mean, they should know already. I mean, yeah, it's been on for a while. But, you know, he wants yeah. to be with his kid. His kid uh, ends that up was a sad... giving his life, which is like, wow. I, I mean, yeah. I guess uh, radicalization they, there. They made a statue of him, too, and all that. Like, oh, you know, he had, I think it was that he had a sickle disease or something. He had some genetic. Uh, Isn't it ALS? Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. No, I think that's what it was, but it was from his side. I know that. Yeah. And yeah, they made a statue of him, and that was weird. Just an, yeah. an, another way to break the the hearts of everyone watching. Like, oh my god, <laughs> this is what that is. Oh, but like Frank's ending. Oh, that was. That's really brutal. But like yeah. his character, like how he became that source of hope, even after every bad thing that happened to frank and his face is red everything is yeah because of the bombing um but he somehow then just turns back to art and makes like this beautiful like it's just a sun but like it memorizes people well in in the book his character arc that actually it it kind of is exactly what his arc is in the book and it's it it makes more sense in the anyways i'll I'll speak more about the book later but yeah it was a good way for them to like give a good nod to the character yeah and and to have keto actually spoiler like keto behead him like I, i i thought no other person could do that other than keto just because of that relationship and that moment those two shared and i'm like see right there that is why the Nazis would never have won was because those type of human emotions would eventually be like, shit, like we're just killing all these people. And like, if I get to know even one of them, I'm going to have a mental breakdown because I can't kill anymore. But like the ending was just. Uh, The ending. I don't know. They didn't know what to do. Uh... Uh, Like it was cool. Like the East coast is liberated. Um, so now that's probably going to incorporate the buffer zone into a new U.S. Well, yeah, Japan, they basically Japan just doesn't want to fight over it. They want to just let the Germans because they know it's it's yeah, World War uh, Three. They already have enough problems at home, and they're like, we have like Asia on lockdown, other than China. We're just pulling back. Germany decided, or, uh, Nazi Germany decided to split, whereas John Smith was going to be the Führer of the United States and um, that weird guy from the, I'm from the mountains of Bavaria. Was it, uh, I, I don't remember the, who, who the character was. Was he, it wasn't Heidrich. Uh... No, it was some, I forget no. his name. Uh, maybe if I can find it, but I've, all I know is he, his first line with John, it was like, oh yeah, so I'm from the mountains of Bavaria. And I was just like, cool, this guy seems interesting. And I, I will, I do like how they overthrew Himmler and that whole team and all that, where they they brought in their own forces and just massacred everyone. <laughs> like, that was pretty entertaining. Bet you didn't see that one coming, huh? But then John Smith goes and tries to do some wonky shit with the, the teleporter and ends up being killed. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a classic, you know, you can't get everything. You can't have your yeah. cake and eat it scenario. But that's exactly like he became Fuhrer of um, the United States. But even that, he was like, he, he didn't even want that. He wanted it, but he didn't. And, and in, in the series, I really like the dichotomy between him and his wife, because she, she becomes one of the more powerful characters in the show. Yes. And her interpretation of how things should be, it's... It's really interesting when you read the book that she 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 she's one of the few who understands what they have lost and what the mm-hmm. world could have been, and for a lot of the people like John Smith, he he can't even acknowledge that until he goes to the parallel universe where he's like mind blown. He's like, oh, the world could not be Nazi Germany, you know, it could yeah. be like it was before. But then yeah, then I would guess afterwards, maybe the U.S. Germany kind of survives for a bit, but I feel like with Japan pulling out of the uh, the West Coast, yeah. with the buffer zone, well, apparently the Germany invaded the buffer zone. To, yeah, they do. But at that point, with John Smith gone, and it was his, uh, his friend who takes over, who apparently was a little more liberal. Like, I... I kind of believe that 
it would either be two U.S.s or the West Coast would have eventually unified as the new as the United States. I, I, it's funny. It's fu it's funny you you say it like that. I didn't even think about this until you said how how is the the world going to go because the the purpose of the book is an issue of balancement. Yeah, and the inevitability that things will balance was basically what the book was saying. Yeah. So it, it's funny you mentioned that. So yeah, perhaps his death meant that someone would bring back America and things would become more balanced out well yeah. yeah it would essentially you would have the u.s stuck in the americas you would have germany hands down controlling europe and part most of africa if not all of africa yeah. um japan being able to kind of create a sphere in, in asia could conquer all of that put, put that down so essentially you would have three well you would have two world powers and an emerging U.S., but I think no, four. The, Canada has been strong yeah, throughout all of this. Canada is independent. I, you know what? No, this is what happens. The yeah. West Coast gets freed. Germany kind of leaves the U.S. Open Canada the doors. Out, Canada comes in and invades. Be like freedom coming, boys. And now yeah. Canada is the third superpower controlling all of North America. And the only thing the Americans can do is set up truck convoys to, you know. <laughs> Stall <protest. our> towns. <laughs> but unfortunately i think in a scenario like that the world ends in nuclear apocalypse just because well it seems like that was what was going to happen yeah like show, no matter yeah. which way you said it with a a germany that still is powerful in europe a japan that's so powerful in asia give it a few decades everyone's going to be going to war with each other again the u.s or the the new canada let's just call it the the, the new canada would still be rebuilding after being demolished. Like, yeah, they probably would have got all the equipment from Germany that was left over, but it's going to take time to rebuild the country. Like it's, I think eventually Germany and Japan are going to nuke each other and the U S if it doesn't get nuked may come out on top afterwards. But overall, I think in this TV series, it is highly entertaining, but it's essentially everyone's going to die. And Oh, and wait, but no, that's the book, not in the TV series. I was going to say... Uh, the TV series, we end with all these people coming through the parallel universe door. And whatever that's supposed to mean, I think I understand it given the book's ending, that it's uh, it means it's balancement, that okay. there's going to be... There's people who died for various reasons in other parts of the parallel universes, and they're all coming back, and they're creating a yin and yang. It, I, I, actually, I I can't even go. I it's yeah, I don't even know how to describe Philip K. Dick's ideology, but yeah. But no, you're absolutely right on that. That actually might make sense if you have all the people that the Germans and the Japanese had killed come into this universe. Then that essentially completely repopulates uh, yeah. the entire U.S. Oh, geez, yeah, and, you're right. Everybody that was killing the genocides can basically come through those doors, right? And so. uh, yeah, it's probably yeah. They they don't understand what happened. But everyone who's left over in the U.S. does, and then or Canada now, is uh, pretty pissed off, and they they rebuild, and they're probably going to be like, "Well, let's go kick some Nazi ass again." All right. So the book now, I think we I think we went part the three. Series. Yeah. Hold on to your butts. Okay, so part three is called "Hold on to your butts." Uh, <laughs> I I can't even do this justice. I'll say right up front to the people who are avid readers of Philip K. Dick, I do not even understand what his religious philosophical ideology is because he is a mysterious man that dwelled into a rabbit hole when it came to inner perspectives on reality. So if you read a uh, uh, Scanner Dark, uh, guys, a Scanner Darkly, a Dark, uh, God, I'm mispronounced. Uh, anyways, if you read <laughs> yeah, yeah. Blue Electric Sheep, uh sleep uh which is blade runner and the scanner darkly i think that's the other one which i read and the man in the high castle and all of his books have kind of this under underlying theme and it's questioning uh your reality the title of my address is if you find this world bad you should see some of the others the subject of this speech 
is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. I may be talking about something that does not exist. Therefore, I'm free to say everything or nothing. We are living in a computer programmed reality. That is one of the biggest themes in all of his books. And it plays out here like unbelievably. Uh, so to go into the smaller tidbit things, uh, there's less characters obviously in the book. The book covers just a few days. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, in the book, Hitler dies of syphilis. He's not even alive in the book. And Martin Bormann is chancellor of Germany instead. Oh, sorry, Hitler's not, Hitler, Hitler's not dead. He's dying of syphilis, but Martin uh, Bormann... So Bormann takes over a responsibility as... And I, I can't not see Bormann with a cigar in his mouth like an Italian mob boss, because that, that guy was the biggest yeah. piece of shit. That guy controlled everything, if you but think about funny, it. But it's funny, like... I feel like not many people know. No, no one him. knows about this guy. This guy was like the secretary to Hitler. And all he did yeah. was kind of like Joseph Stalin style. Make sure that Hitler can't be talked to. That he's the only guy you yeah. go between two. He built him this resort so he could keep him like, far away. Even like Himmler, Goring, like all of them. They had to go through Bormann. They had to yeah. go through him. To Bormann, get would to have, Hitler. Bormann would have won. Bormann yeah. was a ruthless businessman. And that's what they all were. They weren't and, smart business people. A report this week, which was referenced, does indicate that your company has a bank account in China. I mean, I was a businessman doing business. Hitler listened to him. Like, Bor like he would literally yeah. tell him, like, this isn't a good idea. We, we might lose this. or Because Bormann knew. Idea. Bormann understood yeah. how to have, he was a good administrator. And, like, someone like Himmler, like Himmler was a deranged was, occultist. He wouldn't be yeah, able to. He wasn't good at anything other than the, the worst thing. He was a loser. And even that, he wasn't even in charge. He, he didn't even come up with it. It was his yeah. underlings that came up with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Heydrich, uh, Heydrich did most yeah. of the work for him. He's the one who just went along with it. And like, he was even given command of an army at one point near the end because it was like... Yeah, he was a joke. He was, And he spent yeah. most of his time at the end of the war in Switzerland getting massages, trying to broker a deal with the Allies. He was, yeah, yeah. He was like, oh, I'll, I'll even release this train of Jews, if you let me... Uh, yeah, and that's what he was doing, right? And then you have Goring, who was just addicted to morphine and fat. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he had long checked out. After yeah. the failure of the Battle of Britain, he was just like, uh, we're done. I don't know what to say about Goebbels. Goebbels is creepy as hell to look at as a human yeah. being. And the fact that he killed all of his children at the end, like, god damn. Oh, these people yeah. are disgusting. Yeah, no, these people, at the, at the end of the day, like, this series, a book or TV series, really did highlight just, oh, the worst people possible won. Yeah. All right. So, Tagami, Tagami in the show, you're seeing uh, you're probably classic scenes. He has uh, these sticks. He rolls them up in his hands and he throws them on his table. I forget the name of what this is uh, actually called, but when I was looking up, it's, I think it's pronounced, it's the I Ching, and it's basically a a bit of a religious kind of it's like a philosophical kind of thing of like the the you know the eight ball we have yeah yeah you you're trying to figure out a decision and you're leaving it to basically a random or gods to decide upon philip k dick actually used it to write the book so the events in the book sometimes he actually left it to this random element uh yeah. the ending actually was based upon just randomly doing this uh thing and i know people who are listening can't see me shaking my hands with the, the sticks but if you if you watch the show you see tagami do it often uh there's a big point as to th that has a lot to do with his bizarre or extravagant look on life where he he went into the occult a lot he he studied many different philosophies and he Really, really did a lot, a lot of drugs, a shit ton of drugs to try to try to feel, what would you call it, like uh, the breaking of reality, as uh, Joe Rogan would say, have you ever tried DMT, bro, kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. And uh, in this book, whew, yeah, this, this book really goes down the rabbit hole. Uh, a major difference from the book and the movie is in, in the, I'm sorry, in the, in the series. In the series, it's a, it's a film reel. The, you know, the, it's called The Grasshopper Who Lies Heavy is the original film that Juliana Crane finds, which shows her this alternate reality. In the book, it's a book because it would make more sense in the 60s. So it's a book that depicts a alternate reality in which Britain wins World War II and Britain becomes a tyrant. 
and naturally <laughs> so so people should be aware and it's even in the man the high castle tv series like you should be aware it's not our reality that's the original reality shown and there are multiple realities later in the show that's shown but that's important to note that this is not exactly our our world that we know it and uh only a few of the characters exist in the book so tagami is basically the same he's a japanese man uh, same job position everything doing the i ching and he he struggles basically with what he has feelings of kind of he doesn't understand why but he feels bad and he feels things are going wrong and throughout the book by the end he has an epiphany where he he's looking at a pin and this pin is kind of i guess the the schwerpunkt it's like the the focal point of the entire story is the talking about this pin where the pin everyone remarks is it looks like balance man and when he focuses and meditates on the pin he suddenly sees everything around him when he's in a park but instead of seeing japanese people subjugating white people he sees white people treating japanese people terribly in this alternate world and quite terribly and it makes him come to the realization that things are quote unquote not in balance is how he sees it now in, in the book frank fink who makes jewelry and uh like kind of like the americana aspect of the series he has a partner which is uh i think his name is curtain the guy in the antique store and they have an intertwined story so frank fink he gets uh, put in jail by the nazis eventually he's caught but it's to get me who when he sees this alternate world kind of thing this vision he he releases him from his prison by demanding they release him and, he, and frank gets out and then tagami has a heart attack and he dies but he dies kind of like with this existential ending where he like feels the world is balancing out and i think he's one of the last guys that kind of finishes his arc frank fink goes back to the antique store and he starts to make real jewelry by hand now, Curtin feels throughout the whole book like he's a piece of shit because he feels he isn't selling anything real. He's selling fraudulent stuff. And he feels terrible about this. He feels inferior to the Japanese and he has a real chip on his shoulder. When Frank Fick comes back and says, I can make real authentic American jewelry, Curtin, his end of the arc is, I can sell this with pride. A sense that things are getting better. And Frank Fink, he, he, he gives his life to art. He doesn't die in the book. And his, the end of his arc is he feels good. He actually is finding purpose. Well, thank God. <laughs> like it's better least, than the series. Yeah. I was going to say, like, if anyone deserves some type of happiness, it's that goddamn guy. <laughs> uh, Joe, I think yeah. the name of the uh, guy. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he just gets, uh, he, he's just an assassin who sent to chase after juliana crane and uh, she eventually just kills him and i think she takes drugs before she does it it's a very weird ending well yeah that, that is different because we know in the series she just it's almost the same the, yeah the well same yeah she she takes a razor blade and goes whoop. i think that's actually i she grabs something in her purse i thought it was a i think it's a gun or something and she ends up killing him and it's really abrupt yeah. but uh you know she is on the same sort of journey in the book where she she gets this book called the grasshopper lies heavy and she's trying to find the man in the high castle the man that wrote this book I and mean, it's very similar to the series where she finds this man but the interpretation of that is basically what encompasses the whole story is when the last i think it's the last few pages when she finally finds uh what was his name abbotson or something hawthorne hawthorne something uh that's i'll, I'll get into it a little bit later but that's what the book is actually about is when she finally meets this guy. I'm trying to think my notes. Is there anything else? It's, there's a lot different. I already said, you know, the world is a little different. Like the the, the Germans are in space. Uh, Mediterranean Sea is drained. Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing about colonizing the moon and colonizing Mars. I'm just like, wow, that is impressive. But here's the important things and what the book is trying to present to you. At the time of the events in the book, in uh, 1962 or 63, I can't remember, the Germans are about to perform a genocide against uh, Africa, against the Africans, and they're re-adopting slavery. In our world, in the 1960s, what was the time period? It was the emancipation period, when all the civil rights people came up. 
and Martin Luther King and everything. And it's, it's a mirror. It's the opposite. Mm, it's the opposite okay. of our world, right? And that's, uh, that's what feeds into this. If you look at everything in the book is different, but specifically not different. And the, the case in point is he, he, Philip K. Dick was trying to make some really interesting points with the book. One of the most interesting points was this is a world where the Nazis won World War II. But if you look at it, everybody is as they should be. Nothing has actually changed. The idea was, yes, there's a butterfly effect. Yes, many events change things, but everybody ends up being what they were going to be. Frank Fink was going to be an artist. Togami sees the world is wrong, and he eventually corrects it in a way by doing what he does, by getting Frank Fink out. Uh, who else is there? Uh, there's John, a main John character. Uh, John Smith doesn't really exist in this. Oh, see. I don't think he's even a character. The the German, I think he in the series, he's the German guy who's pretending to be a Swede to get the plans to. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, there's a subplot where I think his name is Baines or something. He's trying to get information to defeat the uh, the German right from within, and he has a group of like people, and he's going to do something. And the end of the book is him getting to Germany and uh, trying to like start this whole other movement. Then the last two. Well, the last character is Juliana Crane. And she finally finds the man in the high castle. And this is where things get kind of really weird for people. Like, you have to go down the rabbit hole to try to understand what Philip K. Dick's getting at. But there's an emphasis on the pin. The pin is like this weird, it's not even a single object, it's this thing. Like, at the beginning of the, of the book, I think it's Frank Fink says, like, I made this pin, you should um, mail it to someone, he says to Juliana Crane, and he talks about it being like, it's the envisionment of balancement or something. She, it, it, she gets, when she meets the man in the high castle, the first thing he says to her is he's like looking at her pin. He's like, oh, where'd you get that? It's like, it embodies all this, whatever. And, you know, she rightfully asks him, she goes, hey, you wrote this book, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. This is, this is true. This is, this is a real thing. And then he looks at her and he's like, excuse me, what are you saying? And she's like, you know, the Germans and the Japanese, they lost World War II. And then he just, he's infuriated and he goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's not a possibility. And he's angry and he sends her away. And that's like the end of the book, basically, is she goes away. And I think, I don't know if it's after that, she ends up killing Joe. And I'm sorry to the audience who knows the story better than me, because I'm doing this, like I read it like 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. But she, uh, she bothers him when she says this and she feels what she's saying is true and she has an extra what do you call it almost like a paranormal experience where she speaks to someone by doing the I Ching again oh. the, uh, she speaks to someone that's just referred to as the oracle and the oracle tells her well when she she asks the oracle this question is uh the grasshopper lies heavy is this truth the oracle tells her this is truth uh, the Japanese and the Germans lost World War II. But what the Oracle kind of says to her is, this isn't, um, this isn't, how, how to put this, it's, it's really interesting, because if this is what, if you understand it, it kind of breaks you a little bit. It goes, the world as you, basically the world as you know it isn't true. So you're in a false reality. Mm. All right? And then the Oracle basically is, kind of indicating but i'm in a false reality so the world of like whatever you saw in this film is potentially the real reality but i'm in a reality where and it's our reality this isn't real so what the basically the end of the book is our reality they're saying to you as it's a fourth it's yeah. a breaking the fourth wall we're not in the real world so essentially it's no one's in the real world and there's just an infinite amount of universes. So you can't really claim that there is one true universe when all of the universes technically exist. Yeah. I, I remember I tried to find the quotes at the end. Juliana meets Abinson and he says, well, the man in the high castle, he tells her, what's that pin on your dress? Does it ward off anima spirits or the immutable world? Or does it just hold everything together? This is like this balancement because Phil K. Dick really believed in this idea of yin and yang and balancement. 
And uh, yeah, much like the the end question of do electric sheep sleep um, with Blade Runner, if you've, if you've seen the movie, is the guy a human being or is he a replicant? And does that matter? Does it matter that he's a real human being or does it matter that he is like this made up Android thing? It's just like that, the man in the high castle, it's, it's a kind of a play on question your reality and the meaning of it, you know? And it goes further than that because the guy was really into a lot of different things. But uh, more or less, the, the character arcs for all the characters in the book, it's, it's really to achieve this kind of balancement that everything will come back from yin to yang or from yang to yang. And in The Man in the High Castle, another underlying theme, which is kind of like the unpleasant one, is there's three worlds pr present in the book. The world of men in the high castle that we see is Nazi Germany and Japan are tyrants mm -hmm. over the rest of the world. And there's a Cold War situation. So Japan and Germany are against each other because the outcome of World War II is they control the world and now they're at, at odds. And you're in our world together. The reality was that the Allies won and then the United States and Soviet Union were at odds and arguably were in Philip K. Dick's view of the world were tyrannical, both of them. He has the argument about that. The grasshopper lies heavy. Uh, it's Britain becomes this ultimate power against other peoples, which I think it's the Soviet Union. It's Britain against the Soviet Union, if I remember correctly. And they're both tyrannical. Like Britain does horrible things to India and all that. So what he's saying is, despite any of that context, the world is it's identical. It's tyrant. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's a different face. Exactly. So he's giving a really, I, I would personally, from my, my opinion, it's a very dark message about how inevitability is there and how we are the way we are just are. Very interesting. And uh, for, for those who actually were curious, Philip K. Dick was going to write a sequel and it is absolutely much more crazy. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> And he didn't write it because after a few pages, he said he couldn't stomach the Nazi stuff anymore because he did so much research into the Nazis. Yeah. He, he actually hated it. And he said someone else would have to do it for him. But it was going to go into outer space with aliens. Aliens yeah. that were going to stop Juliana Crane and the man in the high castle from getting the knowledge of the reality. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, uh, if I title this uh, podcast, The Wonkiness of the Man in the High Castle, it's pretty wonky. No, it's all over the way. Like I said at the beginning of this podcast, was yeah, man, was it entertaining? Yeah, for sure. Like it, all over the place. But historically, yeah, it's so far from the truth. Like there are some similarities, and like, okay, if Germany did take over the U.S., probably would look like that. But other than that, yeah, it was just a, a wild roller coaster of entertainment. Well, you notice in the in the series, America is breaking the shackles of Nazi Germany because it's it can't hold on. It's unreasonable, yeah. and Japan pulls away. In in the book, it's the same sense where, despite any of the outcomes of World War II, the world was going to settle in mm -hmm. to what we kind of already see it today as. Which I I don't know how I don't know why Philip K. Dick went with that route. I don't know what he was actually thinking. I guess he, he had just had this philosophy, like this philosophy, yeah, this balance. Yeah, this, this thought about balance. And... But yeah, and uh, and a lot of drugs. I'm I'm just, I'm not making a joke. Like Phil K. Dick did a lot of drugs. Uh, I'm not surprised. It's Scanner a... Darkly is just about drugs and perception change. It's yeah. <laughs> well, all right. I think uh, I think we've been going for a good hour now. Yeah. And I uh, can't wait to see how this uh, podcast performs because this is going to be a real different one. That was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun going down memory lane of this series. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about Deadliest Warrior, the show that should have continued for 10 more seasons. Yeah, because, you know, once we found out what a zombie and a vampire could do, you know, oh my God. the gates were open for anything. They need to do uh, some. They need to do some rematches. I'm so so salty about the, what was it? Uh, God, who lost it? It the ended. Viking, versus Viking, samurai. Viking versus samurai to this day. And I mean, I studied Japanese history, and I still say the Viking would win. I don't know about that because remember, the Vikings were not these six feet tall, 
No, I know that, but... They were vicious warriors, but so were the samurai. <laughs> like, I think it would come down to who has the better equipment. Yeah, but the, the Japanese samurai doesn't use defensive weapons. It wouldn't be able to, like, he it wouldn't make sense. Mace. He uses mace or spear, and he's done. The, the katana sorry. was a last-ditch weapon. They, they didn't yes. use the katana in battle. No, the like, katana like, was hardly... It, the Japanese weapon yeah. of choice, the samurai, was a bow and arrow for the majority of the history. Yeah. And they had, like, their... I, I don't know the names, but they had the huge mace. Like, one shot of that would have broken the Vikings' shield. Anyways, now people are like, topic. "What are you talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this has been the yeah. Pacific War Channel. Catch you later, Eric. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, now. everyone, again. Hey, and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button so I can feed my two feathery co-hosts. Yeah.